If we all could, let us bow our heads for prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, we want you to be glorified. We want you to be magnified. We want you to be seen and heard today. So place a veil over me. Hide me behind the Holy Spirit. Fill us all with your sweet, holy presence. And may the words that proceed from this lump of clay only bring you praise, honor, and glory. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm glad to be a child of the King. What about you? I want us to take our Bibles this morning, the truth book, turn it to the book of John, and we're going to look at chapter 17, John chapter 17 and beginning at verse 20 and 23. And I'm going to say this, I've, I've been to several churches and when the word of God is read, people stand. And I hope that it's not a formality because God is worthy of our praise. Every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. One day, even the devil will touch the ground and give God the honor. And so we're going to read together. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. And, and this is what we want to do. If you're a New King James reader, I want you to read out loud. But if you're not a King James reader today, if you could just be silent. We don't want... We want to have harmony today, amen? So if you're a King James Bible, I mean a New King James Bible holder, we want you to read out loud together, amen? Oh, it's on the screen. Thank you so much. I don't have those amenities in my church, but to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Father God, as we read your word, breathe again upon us in Jesus' name, amen. Let's read together. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Amen. You may be seated. This afternoon, I want to talk to you on the topic, oneness. Oneness. Through the Gospels, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we read how Jesus' life was punctuated with numerous prayers. The prayer before raising Lazarus from the grave, John 11, chapter, John chapter 11, verses 41 and 42. He prays before choosing his 12 disciples, Luke 6 and verse 12. The prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord. The three prayers on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Luke 23 and verse 34. On the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Matthew 27 verses 46 and Mark 15 and verse 34. And lastly, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Luke 23 and verse 46. The holy, harmless, undefiled Jesus 
breathe prayer as we breathe air. His dependence on the Father was always foremost. Several of the prayers that Jesus prayed were often short and simple, and there were prayers that were never heard by human ears. The Bible records that Jesus would get up a great day, great time before day and pray. There were times he would spend all night in prayer. However, in John chapter 17, we are privileged to enter Jesus' prayer closet where the longest prayer of Jesus is recorded. 26 verses of intimate conversation with Abba, Father. The prayer in John 17 is divided into thirds. We see first in John 17, verses 1 through 5, he prays for himself. When you pray, church, don't forget to pray for yourself. You know, often they tell the pastor, pastor, pray for me. But have you prayed for yourself? Because God listens to your prayers and he answers your prayer. We also find that Jesus prays for his disciples. He's concerned about his followers. And so he prays for them in verses 6 through 19. But this is the best part. John 17, verses 20 through 26, he prays for all believers. Somebody ought to say amen. He prays for all believers. Before his betrayal and arrest in Gethsemane, Jesus prays an all-inclusive prayer for all his believers. And we sit here today having been and will continually be prayed for. It is a blessing to know that Jesus not only prayed for himself, not only prayed for Peter and Peter and James and Bartholomew and, and Matthew, but he prays for us. You see, I want to let you know his prayers are active and proactive. Uh, he's praying for those that will come after us. His prayers are continually being lifted up in behalf of his followers. So this afternoon, I want us to take a little time to peruse the passages of Scripture found in John chapter 17. And as we enter into the prayer closet of Jesus Christ, the righteous, we find here in verse 20, Jesus speaks these words. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Jesus' disciples grew to know him through their five senses. They heard him. They tasted what he tasted. They touched him. They could smell him. They saw him with their eyes. When it came to learning Jesus, when it came to learning who Jesus was, every sensory element was engaged. Jesus is now praying for second generation disciples, believers, who will get to know him by the word. Somebody say word. Of those who did life with Jesus, we get to know who Jesus is through the word that was preached through the apostles' doctrine what they had experienced, what they had touched, what they had seen, they testified of who Jesus was. And today, many of us sit here because we fully believe that the testimony of the disciples was true. The Word, my friends, we believe because of the Word. Just think, we are here today believing in Jesus because of the testimony about Jesus. You see, I want to tell you, young people, you may not know the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, but all you need to do is tell them what you know is about J-E-S-U-S. Amen? Oh, my friends, 
We believe Jesus because of the testimony. We can say we have not seen him nor touched him, but we believe in him because of the words that were shared by his disciples. Jesus said in John 20 and verse 29, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. You know, I used to go to my kitchen table when I was preparing to go into the ministry and I wanted God to sit down on the other side of the kitchen table and tell me what he had me to do. And I must say, while I sat there, I was waiting for him to pull up a chair and sit down. But guess what? Jesus never showed up, but the word of God tells me he will never leave me nor forsake me. Matter of fact, he says he dwells within me. I am his dwelling place. He calls me a temple. And if you pray the promises of God, God will answer every single time. It may not be on your time, but it'll be according to his holy clock. Amen. Oh, blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. Wow, that's real faith. Somebody said, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You have not necessarily heard God's thundering voice. And matter of fact, the Bible doesn't mention that his voice is thundering. It's just a whisper, a still small voice that speaks to us. Amen. Oh, my friends, I want us to look again at the word of God in verse 21. We want to look at the request that Jesus makes to Abba Father in our behalf. You know, when I found this verse, I just thought it was amazing how God labors for you and I. He prays for us. He agonizes for us. He wants us to be assured that he loves us with an everlasting love. And so in verse 21 of John chapter 17, he says that they all may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. What is the request, church? What is Jesus asking of God? Well, it's simple that they all may be one, as in the Father and the Son are one. But let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me see if I can help you. Holy Ghost, help us. How would we describe oneness, this oneness Jesus speaks of? You see, my friends, Jesus explains it like this. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing, John 15 and verse 5. Now, let me clarify, because sometimes when the Bible is preached, it's too raw. So let me simplify it. When you see a car traveling down the road, all four tires are moving in the same direction. The back tires are not rolling forward and the front tires are not rolling backwards. The tires are all rolling in unison in the same direction. Someone said, oneness does not mean aloneness. Huh? Our oneness is not our individualism, our heritage, our creed, our ethnicity. Our oneness is not our denominationalism or our unique, unique interpretation of the 2300-day prophecy, but our center and gravity of our oneness is in the Son of God. Like the earth rotates around the sun, the believer's life rotates around the S-O-N. If a man be in Christ, he is a 
new creature. Why? Because his old nature has been put to death and he's been given, he gives way his old life for the new life in Christ Jesus. Paul says, I die daily. How often does he die? He says, I die daily. I die daily, and the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live, but it is Christ that liveth in me. Oneness is not, oneness is not about me, myself, and I. While Jesus was here in the flesh, he said, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. What is he saying? And then, and then he it goes on to say, I can of my own self do nothing. Squeaky clean Jesus can't do anything of himself? No, he's totally dependent upon the Father. I'm going to continue to quote what Jesus says. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Oneness, my friends. The Father and the Son are like Siamese twins. They are joined at the head and the heart. They talk alike, they walk alike, they think alike. They are continually in oneness. If you have seen the Son, you've seen the Father. They're one in spirit, objective, and goal. They have the same purpose, and that is to seek and save that which is lost. Amen. And so, my friends, the Christian aim and goal is to be in oneness with the Father and the Son. Why? Why? That the world may believe in God, that the world may believe in God who sent Jesus. You see, there's a big problem in our world today. Many people don't believe in God. Why don't they believe in God? They need to see some testimonies in his followers and his believers. They need to see some agreement with black and white, red and yellow, that they might believe. They need to see when you go through pain and punishment, you stand strong, still believing in a God that you can't see with the naked eye. Oneness. Oneness and the purpose, my friends, that Jesus prays is that God would be credible. Our oneness in the Father and Son gives bold evidence that God exists through the Son. I must admit, we often misrepresent the Father and the Son. When we are not in oneness with God, we cannot bring people to believe in God. Our focus is turned inward instead of outward. You know, when I rehearse the sins that I've committed, it's always because of I or me. I had an old elder back in Niles, Michigan at the Niles Philadelphia Church. He would stand up and he said, uh, you take I out of sin and you don't have sin. Our focus is turned inward instead of upward and outward. Before the creation of man, Jesus knew that we would need oneness with him to help us make God known. They will know we are Christians by our what? But I want to say they will know we are Christians by our oneness. Oneness. Oh, listen, my friends. 
The voice to the remnant church says this. Those who desire to see this prayer answered should seek to discourage the slightest tendency to division and try to keep the spirit of unity and love among the brethren. Review and Herald, May 29th, 1988, or 1888, excuse me. Excuse me. When there is oneness with the Father and the Son, there will be no cliques among us. No racial divides, no doctrinal dogfights uh, where we are left limping and complaining in our corners of despondency. Oneness in the Father and Son will always keep believers unified, not divided. And I'm going to say it, I'm tired of that group of church folk on that side of town and this group of church folk on that side my friends if we're going to finish the work and unify with the father and son we can kick the devils behind we are better together than we are apart it's foolishness to be over there be over here be over there it's time to come together we are forced to be reckoned with when we unify with the father and the son Bump the power struggle. Bump the money. I'm trying to get up out of here. We act like this is out, not here at Orchard Park, but some of us at Seven Day Adventists, we act like the earth is our home. Ain't nothing down here I like. Now, I got to deal with some cars because I'm looking for a new car. But Lord, help me. We, 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 I, ain't nothing much down here I desire. Don't let me, Lord help me, forgive me, Pastor. I get, I get excited. I, let me get back to the script. See when I, But anyway, what are we talking about? Oneness. Ain't going to be no schism up in here. Because we're going to be one with the Father and one with the Son. And if it's not about my will and it's about glorifying God's will, we will get along. I was, I've been to many churches, and, and, and they said, Pastor, we need more love in the church. You know what we need more? More of? We need more consecration and oneness with God and the Father. God, God the Father and God the Son. When you connect with God, all that falls together. And I want to say something to the church. When Jesus prayed this prayer, it wasn't necessarily a prayer that we all sing kumbaya and just get along. The main focus, church, is to connect with the Father and the Son. When you connect with the Father and the Son, you will connect with the brothers and sisters in the church. Seek ye first oneness with the Father and the Son, and all them other things will come together. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Oneness in the Father and the Son will always keep believers unified. But I want to let you know something. There's something I found here in, in, in John chapter 17 and beginning at verse 22. I, I, I see something here. God gives his believers a gift. How many like gifts? And I like giving gifts. The word is true. You, it's more blessed to give than to receive. But I like to see the expressions of my children and my wife when I give them a gift. And I believe when Jesus, when I, when I, when I share with you what's going to happen, you're going to smile. Amen? Because God loves giving gifts. And I find something here in verse 22. Jesus says, and the glory which you gave me. He's talking to the Father now. Ah, but you gave me some glory. But, 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 Father, I want to give my believers. Forgive me. I want to give my, I want to give my believers 
Look now, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. Tell yourself, God has given me glory. Now, don't get, it, don't get too happy now. <laughs> Let's talk about this glory. Huh? What I mean, keep your composure. It's good news. God, God has already blessed you. And he's giving you his glory. He likes sharing. And, and so Jesus prays to give his be- believers glory. What is that? Well, when you go to the original language, doxa. Doxa means glorious condition, a most exalted state. Well, what is that? What is that, Pastor? Who only has eternal life? Huh? Who, who only has eternal life? The Father, the Son, Holy Ghost. Huh? But check it out. <laughs> God is good on a Sabbath morning in the afternoon. Amen. It says in John chapter 17 and verse 2, Jesus is speaking. He says, John chapter 17 and verse 2, he says, as you have given him authority, he's talking to God again, he's talking about himself, as you have given him authority, given me authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. In other words, all who belong to Jesus in faith through Jesus Christ, he gives them eternal. Now look, we don't have to wait another 50 years, another 100 years. We don't even have to wait till tomorrow to get eternal life. You have eternal life right Nah, ain't that good news? Yeah, we may go to sleep. But God the Father and God the Son are going to wake us up. Don't they have all authority in heaven and earth? Didn't they snatch the keys from the devil? Snatch the the, the life, death from, from, from the devil? If we go to sleep, that's all right. Because Abba will wake us at the appointed time. Amen? Oh, the time that we live in is tough, it's rough, but I'm so glad that Jesus promises us we shall experience trouble and trial, but I've overcome this world. And if you lose your life, not so much lose your life, but if you go to sleep for a little while, it's the mercy of God. Amen? Amen? But I'm just here to let you know you've got eternal life. This glory that Jesus gives his believers is eternal life. It's it's a glorious condition. A most exalted state. John says in in John says it in 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 1 John chapter 5 beginning at uh, verse 11 through 13. Listen to this. John says this in 1 John 5 11 through 13. Do you see it? We got to, we got to believe it. And this is the testimony that God has given us what? And this life is in his son. He who has the son has what? And he who does not have the son does not have life. Do you have Jesus today? These things have I written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe, continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Oh, my friends, on the cross of Calvary, Jesus became our eternal security. You know, I found this intriguing and 
very mind-boggling. But the Bible says, for God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. That we might become the righteousness of God in him. All the sins that we've ever committed and will commit were placed upon the broad shoulders of Jesus Christ the righteous. He bundled them up and carried them to the cross and died the death that we should have died. And in exchange, he died and he gives us eternal life. Amen. Oh, I love what it says in Isaiah. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for, of his peace is upon him and by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 5. You see, our Savior was crushed, mutilated, decimated, pounded with our sins so that we might experience joy and peace, and love, and contentment, and fortune, and community, and relationship. Do you know Jesus can't wait till he's told to come get us? I can imagine, and it's probably not happening, but with my little unsanctified mind, I believe sometime Jesus may just paced back and forth in front of the, the, the Father's throne. And Abba, and he may ask, Abba, uh, can I go today to get my brothers and sisters? Every day he's wondering, will he send me off to capture my people? Church, Jesus is coming soon. He's coming soon. And he's coming for a people who are one with him and the Father. It's time that you can consecrate and get your life right with Jesus today. And I believe the reason God is delaying his coming is because there's still some people who are not calibrated with Christ and the Father. You see, my friends, those four wheels on the tire or those four wheels on the car, sometimes one gets out of the line and it, and it wants to run to the left and everybody going to the right. You ever seen a tire like that? It's slick and ball on the edges. That's because it's hard-headed. The steering wheel is telling it to go straight and it wants to go left. But you know how you can correct that situation? You take that down to the alignment shop and you ask the, the shop owner, can you take my car and recalibrate it? Can you align my wheels? You see, some of us, uh, we want to do our own thing. We want to go to the left instead of go to the right. But God says in his merciful love, it ain't too late to get recalibrated, to line up with my son, because I'll fix you and make you straight. I can take a crooked path and make it straight. God loves us. I'm about to wrap it up. I want to share something with your church. I didn't put it in my notes. But you can put this on the screen, my dear brother. Over in Ezekiel, chapter 36, a powerful couple of verses. This is your alignment, y'all. This is the alignment. And I want to let you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm jacked up from the flow up if it wasn't for Jesus. I'm a mess, bruh. I still sin, 
But my God told me, Jesus told me in his word, I'm faithful and just. No, if I confess now, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me of all my sins. Won't he do it? Yes, he will. Won't he do it? And so my, my friends, I want to let you know, if you want an alignment, this is what God can do for you. He will not only pray for you, he not only will give you glory. And see that word glory, there's another side to that. That glory, you remember when Moses said, I want to see your glory. I just want to see your glory, Lord. I want to see your splendor. Jesus took Moses and put him in the cleft of the rock. And he began to pro pronounce the Lord, the Lord God, holy, I'm paraphrasing, righteous, compassionate, loving, kind. He talked about his character, not how he looked. You know why we can't see God right now? Because God said, that ain't important. I want you to know my glory, and that's my character. I love everybody, red, yellow, black or white they're all precious in my sight but I want to read something to your friends while we are, are seeking to align with God this is what the Bible says beginning at verse 26 Ezekiel 36 says I will give you a new heart that's the new ties huh I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In other words, your heart will beat for the passions of God. Your desires will be the same desires of God. That which God loves, you will love also. And verse 27 says, I will put my spirit. That means the Holy Ghost. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statue. And you will keep my judgments and do them. God gives us everything we need to be saved. So you woke up this morning, looked in the mirror and said, Lord, save me. You are already saved. You got everything you need to continue being saved. He's going to give you a new heart. He'll give you a new spirit. He'll give you. The will to do his will and to do that which is pleasing in his sight. When you want to go to the left, God will softly pull you to the right. Jesus reiterates his prayer request in verse 23. For oneness, belief in God, and God's love for all believers. Verse 23 says, in them you and in me, in them and in you and me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. And I want to focus on that last portion. And have loved them as you have loved me. I want to tell you somebody, the same love, that has been given to the Son, that same love is bestowed upon us. The same love. You know how I know that? Because the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There may be someone here who does not have eternal life. You're not sure of your eternal life. And God is offering it to you today for free. For free. No matter how bad a person is or was, God's love can cover a multitude of sins. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost so love the world that they desired that no one perish. My mother has always said, if someone is lost, 
It's not, she doesn't say this, but I'm adding it. But my mother basically said, if somebody's lost, it's their own fault. God is not slack concerning his promise. It's some men count slackness. But it's long suffering. Not willing that any should perish. Church, and I want to let you know this prayer in John chapter 17, verses 20 to 23. That prayer is effective throughout the ceaseless ages of time. Jesus has gone to the most holy place and he sits at the right hand of the Father. And he prays for us. He labors for us. He lifts our names up in prayer. He's our great high priest. Maybe someone in the audience, if you were to be honest, you say, I, 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 I don't think I have eternal life. Is there someone like that? And, 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 and would you like to receive eternal life today? Jesus died specifically for you. You know, Jesus doesn't want anybody to go to hell. Hell wasn't designed for his created beings except the fallen angels. You know, sometime I'm out in the street and, and, and they'll say that term, go to, that's of the devil. God has prepared a place for you and I. But we must be one with the Father and Son. Maybe somebody needs to reconnect today. Just raise your hand. I want to reconnect with you, Lord. I want to reconsecrate my life to you. Is there someone like that today? Amen. Maybe somebody wants to be baptized. You want a makeover. You want a fresh start. I sense this is a safe church where the Spirit of the Lord is in His people. You need to be a part of a church like that. Is there someone that wants to be baptized? They want to be born again. You might be 40 years old, but God said, I can change the chronology, the, the chronology and make you brand new. So somebody like that want to be baptized? Just raise your hand. I'm going to close it out. Don't want to be long-winded. I'm like a freight train, hard to stop once I get going. But I'm, a, I'm by the Holy Ghost's grace, and I asked and prayed. But, Lord, we thank you. We're going to pray. For, Lord, we thank you for those that have raised their hand that want to reconsecrate themselves to thee. We thank you for those who are contemplating wanting to be baptized. Lord, that they will not wait too, too long. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Thank you, Lord, that you give us all the resources in heaven to help us accomplish our sanctification process. Thank you, Lord, for loving us, dying for us, keeping us, praying for us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that guides us into all truth. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen.